Hi and welcome. Today we are celebrating World Wildlife Day. I'm Danielle Brigida. I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and I'm here with Ken Goddard, Director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Forensic Laboratory. Welcome to our lab. Uh, what we want to do today is walk you through some of the things we do as a wildlife crime laboratory. I should explain right away that while we're very used to working complex crime scenes and dealing with a wide range of sometimes gory, sometimes confusing evidence, we've never been on a web broadcast before. This is a new experience for us. And some of us are uh, more adept to the new uh, social media than others. So we'll see how this all goes. But we want to be able to answer your questions and give you a sense of what we are. Uh, what we are, sadly, is the only crime lab for wildlife in the world. We'd like not to be, but at this point, we're it. Uh, by treaty, we're the crime lab for the 180 countries that signed the treaty to enforce each other's endangered species laws, the CITES Treaty, as well as the crime lab for the Wildlife Working Group of Interpol. That's in addition to working for our 200 special agents uh, who investigate wildlife crimes and about 120 wildlife inspectors and all 50 state fish and game agencies. So uh, you have a sense that we're rarely bored around here. Uh, we get a lot of evidence in uh, every day of the, of the year. FedEx, UPS, Post Office brings us packages and we go to work. And that's what I wanted to explain to you today, uh, exactly what that work is. Uh, a classic example would be us getting a whole animal in, like this Cayman crocodile. Uh, Barry, our uh, herpetologist, takes one look at this, he knows what it is. Uh, because we have the whole animal, we've got the species defining characteristics. We get in something like this, it's a little odd, but it's again easy for Barry to work with because we have pretty much the entire Cayman crocodile attached to this purse. But when we get to something like this, we've lost those species defining characteristics. And so as a, as a laboratory, before we can begin to do the things a crime lab does, which is examine evidence in a triangular fashion, try to link suspect, victim, and crime scene together, we've got to figure out what our victim is, to figure out if a crime has been committed. In this case, uh, we had to conduct research to figure out what would be other species-defining characteristics. And it turns out it's the belly scales that allowed us to tell that this is a Cayman crocodile purse, which we have to distinguish from this guy, which is a little $10 uh, knockoff, it's made out of plastic, but it is made from the imprint of a real hide. So we can get a wide range of confusing evidence in, and uh, I'm hopefully we can explain this. Yeah, thank you so much, Ken. So I'm moderating questions off the camera in case anyone <laughs> can't see me, but um, I've, I've definitely collected a number of questions from online, and I'm gonna be talking through some of this. So this is really interesting in the study of of shape is actually morphology, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the evidence you get in, you can quickly identify, others you can't. Um, mm -hmm. can, you, can you talk a little bit about um, how this lab became the only one and, and what its mission is and sure. what you're trying to do? Uh, way back in 1979, um, I was a former a police crime lab director. I was hired to set this laboratory up. Um, it took a long time to do it. In fact, it took us seven years to get the funding and to get a location. Um, we ended up here in this beautiful valley of Ashland, Oregon, uh, and began accumulating uh, our experts, uh, hiring uh, people for our different sections of the laboratory, which are morphology, uh, pathology, genetics, analytical chemistry, and criminalistics or police forensic science. Uh, we had to find experts uh, who could tell what a Cayman crocodile is. Uh, this isn't a, a, a skill that's taught in universities, uh, the pieces, parts, products. So uh, it may take five, six years for someone to learn morphology. Where in genetics, uh, people coming to us with a degree in biochemistry or genetics, we can easily get them into the flow of our laboratory. That's great. Um, so I think a lot of people are interested um, and maybe a lot of them watch CSI or some of these forensic shows. Um, can, you, can you talk about some of the procedures or processes that you guys use that maybe are featured on some of these shows? Sure. And, and maybe uh, some other uh, for those of you who've watched the CSI show, um, they get it wrong. 
they know it. Um, I probably was as close to anything in that I was a deputy sheriff, CSI, forensic scientist, but I never went chasing after the bad guy. I never interrogated, yelled, uh, handcuffed, any of those sorts of things. My job was to work with the evidence. And, and that's the real difference that I think people have a hard time understanding, and TV doesn't really portray it right. The uh, investigator, the special agent, the game warden, have every right to be emotional, aggressive, and going after the bad guy. That's their job. <clears throat> the prosecuting attorney, again, should be emotional in taking that individual before the courts. The defense attorney has every right to defend his client. Our job is a little bit different. Our job, once we have the evidence in hand, is to speak for that evidence, to represent it in court, not to take sides, but to explain to what degree does this evidence link the suspect and the crime scene to the victim. It's really, it's really important stuff. Um, so I guess the next big question is, you know, in honor of World Wildlife Day, we're, we're talking a lot about wildlife trafficking and, and getting serious about wildlife crimes. Um, are there any overall things that you guys are seeing or receiving into the lab that uh, trends that you feel comfortable? I know you can't talk about current <laughs> cases or anything like that, but trends are things that you're seeing that... Um, well, we're, we see flows of evidence, uh, things like the ivory uh, materials, uh, things like the uh, the birds, the reptiles, uh, wood uh, materials. Uh, in fact, some of our experts are going to explain precisely what we do. That's great. Um, yeah, so uh, if you want to introduce the next person, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about a lot of different new things. So um, we're just going to kind of shift on through. Barry Baker is the chief of this morphology section. He's the fellow who could identify this Cayman crocodile, and he's going to explain what we do here. Welcome. Thank you, Ken. Make yeah, some room here. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, so Ken had mentioned that one of the things that we commonly see as evidence item items here are, are ivory pieces. Um, many of you may be aware that uh, there's extensive poaching of elephants in the wildlife trade. Um, that's been in the news a lot, especially recently with global efforts to curb some of those trends. And so I brought some examples here of various types of ivory today to talk just briefly about how we do some, some of the types of work we do here. That's great. Yeah, I, I don't think everyone knows that ivory doesn't necessarily just mean elephants. I think it's, um, it's, it's actually a lot of different species. Yeah, exactly. So when most people think of the term ivory, they think about elephants. Those are large, iconic an animals for sure. But the term ivory really just means it's a carvable tooth. And there are many animals that can have ivory. Some examples include walruses, uh, even pigs or warhogs can have ivory tusks, um, sperm whales. Um, there, there are many animals, hippopotamus. So in addition to elephant, there are several other taxa that we have to consider. And on top of that, then there are also fake items too. So we, one of the first things that we have to test for is whether it is, in fact, a real biological material. Is it, is it even a tooth? Um, that's kind of where we start. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you do that? Well, the first thing that we do is that, um, especially on a carving such as this, we would look at it under an alternate light source using UV light. And the mineral composition of ivory is... Um, different, of course, from what you would find in plastic, and so those fluoresce def differently under uh, alternate light sources. So we would look at these using UV light, uh, then if it does look like it has a signature that you would see in either bone or ivory, um, then we take a closer look at it and uh, try to find some distinguishing characteristics that either we would see only in bone or only in certain types of ivory. So what do, what do we have here? What are you showing us? So this is part of a walrus tusk. Um, it's just the tip of the tusk. It's been cut off. And for comparison, here's a fake piece of walrus. This is just made from a synthetic resin. And um, it's broken here, so one of the things that I can do is I can look at the cross-section of this and compare it to a real piece of walrus ivory. And uh, I quickly see that on the real piece of walrus ivory, I have certain features of the the various types of dentine uh, and cementum uh, on this tooth, whereas in this fake item, I'm lacking all of those features on the inside. Uh, in addition, this would fluoresce differently under UV light. 
So those are all clues that tell me that this is fake. Yeah, but the lab receives both fake and real, and, and that's one of the first steps. Yeah, and, and that's true of everything, not just for ivory. It can be for leather, as Ken alluded to, that one of these is made of plastic and one is made from real skin. Um, it can be from different types of medicines. Um, it can be, that's one of the first questions that we ask of all of our evidence. Is it real or is it fake? And then if it's real, what is it made out of? What else do you have back there that might be interesting to show? Many people are familiar with narwhals, um, a large whale that has this big tusk or tooth uh, protruding out of the uh, top of its head. Um, this was formerly a a walking stick that's been deconstructed, but it shows the spiral structure characteristic of a narwhal tusk. And then we also have sperm whale, which is commonly carved in a tradition, tradition known as scrimshaw. Um, many of these are real in the trade, but there's also fake ones and plastic ones as well. And then hippopotamus. Their teeth can also be carved. So here's one that's not carved, a lower tusk, and here's one that's carved extensively. So um, how do you tell an animal that's maybe been extinct for a while versus one that, like an elephant or a person passed it on? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, in addition to, so if we're talking specifically about elephant ivory, this is a cross-section of an elephant tusk here. Um, one of the questions that we have to answer is, is this from a modern elephant or could this be from an extinct form such as a mammoth or mastodon? Those may not be protected in certain situations, whereas the, obviously the, the modern elephants are. Um, so early on in the history of this lab, um, some of the researchers did extensive studies on, on cross sections of ivory and found some features in the, the microstructure um, that are called Schrager lines and those can be measured and we can use those as determinations of uh, whether this is in fact is from a modern elephant or from an extinct form. And so this one is is modern um, so that tells me that this is a, um, a modern elephant but then if the question is okay is it an Asian elephant or an African elephant then we would submit that for genetic testing and have DNA done. So DNA can be uh, obtained from all of these types of items as well. So often the, the items come to morphology first. We authenticate if it's real or not, uh, identify it as far as we can, and then if there are further questions, then there's genetic analysis done. Great, thank you. All right, so next we, <laughs> we're going to take a look at some other specimens. Thank you so much. Sure, I'll move these off here so there's <laughs> room for others. I agree is a very serious issue and and definitely one we've been keeping an eye on. Um, and, and for our next segment, if you want to come on and introduce yourself, and then we'll Hi, I'm Pepper Trail. I'm the ornithologist here at the Forensics Lab. And that means I study birds. Ornithology is the study of birds. And we have a very diverse set of evidence types that we examine for ornithology. A lot of it deals with our native North American birds. Um, for example, this is a, a spread tail of a bald eagle, an almost adult bald eagle. A pure white feathers would be a five-year-old or older bird, but this is probably a, a four-year-old, almost adult. And bald eagles are actually the most common species I identify in my casework. Um, there's a lot of there's still a lot of trade in their feathers, uh, and there's also mortality that we get into the lab and we have to determine cause of death with pathology, as you'll hear a little bit later. But one of the projects that we do here at the lab um, is a educational resource called the Feather Atlas, and any of you out there who are interested in feathers and learning how to identify them can just Google Feather Atlas and you'll find the site. And on that site, we have uh, scans of feathers, and these are some nearly adult bald eagle tail feathers with the scale, and uh, also not shown in this picture are data related to the, to the uh, feathers, how large they are and where they're from. So uh, it's really a great resource. We have over 300 species now, which is about half of the North American birds, the wing feathers and the tail feathers. So it's a 
a very popular, it's proven to be a very popular public resource and you can use it to identify feathers, but it's important to make the point that possession of feathers of native North American birds, certainly of eagles, but even of birds you might find at the beach, you know, gull feathers or duck feathers you might find, uh, are not legal to possess. Uh, and that's because of, uh, of uh, a law called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which was enacted in response to the plume trade back of egrets and, and uh, plume birds back way back in the 20th century. Uh, but that law is still on the book. So if you find feathers, enjoy them, identify them, pick them up and look at them, and then put them back down again uh, and leave them where they are. But we also get quite a few uh, international things. Um, and this is sort of an interesting one. Morphology as the study of shape is very dependent on making comparisons between evidence items and between known reference standards. So we have a large museum style collection of different birds. And these are some of the most spectacular birds you could ever run into. These are four different species of macaws, large South American parrots. This is a hyacinth macaw, a red and green macaw, a blue and yellow macaw, and a scarlet macaw. And so these are all birds actually that came from zoos. Um, and so when the birds die in the zoo, they get donated to us for our collection, which is great. And we also get evidence items like this very spectacular South American feathered artifact. Uh, which is illegal to take out of Brazil, and it's also illegal to bring into the country. Um, so this came in originally as part of a case, which has now been settled. But you can see that this spectacular item has all these blue feathers, and it might appear that maybe we've just got one or two of these macaw species represented. But when you turn the object over, not sure how well it'll show up on the camera, but you can see that there's a whole range of colors. There's ones that are almost black underneath, ones that are dark red, ones that are red with a yellowish tinge, and ones that are, are really just yellow. And by using our specimens, we can verify that the really dark ones are the hyacinth macaw, the pure yellow ones are the blue and yellow macaw, the dark red ones are the red and green macaw, and the red ones with the yellowish tinge or the scarlet macaw. And these species are all protected, but they're protected at different levels by international treaty. And so for our purposes, it's very important to be able to make a correct species ID, and we do that using our reference material. Wow. Um, right. Well, this is, this is all very important. And I think that stressing reference materials um, are, is something, a, a common trend I'm seeing as you guys are talking, really using things that you've received before to, um, to kind of use in future cases is, is an important side. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome. Well, I, I think next um, we want to hear from pathology. And did um, you want to see a condor we wing? We did, actually. So condors, from what my understanding, are uh, a common thing that you guys process. Um, well, common may not be the right word okay, since common, they're one yes. of the most endangered species in the world, but, um, but yes, sadly they're uh, fairly frequent in our casework. Um, there are two species of condors in the world. The California condor is a very, very endangered North American species. There's, uh, there used to be only 22 literally in, in surviving in the world, but now it's up to several hundred um, thanks to captive breeding programs. But they still do die in the wild, and they come to pathology, as you'll hear in a second. Just to give you an, a sense of how big they are, this is the wing of a California condor, one that uh, unfortunately died accidentally, and we got the specimen. And to give you an idea of just how big it is, ta-da, here is one of the smallest birds you could find. Here is an entire rufous hummingbird, and you can see that it's much smaller than these individual little underwing feathers of a California condor. So here you've got just about the whole range of sizes of birds. And we even do see these things in the trade, believe it or not. This is an Andean condor feather, the other species of condor. And this, you can see, has got a pin on it. And this actually was seized by our customs officials uh, off of the hat of a gentleman who was coming into Chicago from Poland to attend an international polka competition. 
So there's a trade of Andean condor feathers from Peru to Poland for polka hats and then back into the United States. So you can see that the trade leads us into unexpected places. So with that segue, pathology. Thank you so much. Hello. If you could just uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit yeah. about pathology and what that means. Um, my name is Rebecca Kagan and I'm a veterinarian pathologist here at the lab. So that means I'm a veterinarian with special training in pathology. And so what I do in the lab is I determine cause of death and essentially doing autopsies on animals. So um, about you, you showed us a, a necropsy um, a few days ago, and I'm curious about how many of those do you do every day? Or Yeah, a, a necropsy is another name for an autopsy. So in the human world, you know, when we talk about doing autopsies, that's essentially the same thing. Um, and so there are two pathologists who work here at the lab, and between the two of us, we probably do one or two a day, every day that we're here. Can you talk a little bit about what you are showing us right now? Or? Yeah, I wanted to demonstrate an autopsy on the table, but they wouldn't let me. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit messy, so it's a bit it's a bit graphic. I, yeah, I brought some bones instead, which are nice and clean. We have here at the lab a colony of beetles, and their job is to um, clean off bones sometimes for the reference specimens that Barry and Pepper talked about, and sometimes for pathology because they can it will let us see. Uh, the injuries that were previously covered by bloody gore, essentially. Um, so this is an example. These are these are post cleaned. This is a grizzly bear skull that we got. And what can you tell me about this skull? This is a pretty easy one. Uh, cause of death appears to be a bullet hole. Yes, <laughs> there's a bullet hole. So what the cleaning of the bugs allow us to see this bullet hole, and you can see which way it's going. And when you turn it over, you can see that it just blasted through the back of the skull. Uh, what it also let us see was these little marks in the teeth. So somebody tried to, after the bear was dead, cut the tooth out, realized it's really actually very hard to get a bear tooth out and quit. So we have tool marks on here. We have a bullet trajectory. And we um, have some more evidence that this is what killed the bear because there is a what's known as an acute hole, so it happened right before it died. There's blood staining around the hole, and the edges of the fracture are sharp. So all these things give us clues about how the animal died and what the circumstances of the death were. And you can contrast that bullet hole to this one. This is a Florida panther, and we cut through it, so pretend that it's all one piece. But this is a Florida panther skull, and it was found by a roadside. And so when we x-rayed the skull, we found a big chunk of metal on the x-ray and that will show up as a big white piece. But what we also found were injuries that looked like it had been hit by a car. So the question is, did somebody shoot the, the cat or did it get hit by a car? How did it die? Um, so when we give the skull to the bugs and they clean it off, you can see how different this hole is. It's got um, rounded edges and it's uneven. And this is actually the bone trying to heal. So what happened was this cat had gotten shot in the nose and the bullet had lodged in there a long time ago before it died. And what actually killed it was being hit by a car. So um, that's some of the things that bones can tell us and that the bugs to help, help us to see. Yeah, so aside from the bugs, what are some of the techniques you use to kind of um, answer these questions that you get asked, I guess, from the cases? Well, we, we obviously do the autopsy, which is actually kind of like you see on television. We just open up the body and take pictures and document our findings, and we do microscopic examination on tissue, so that lets you look for other things, I mean, diseases and things like that. They don't, we don't kill all of them, believe it or not. <laughs> Sometimes it's nobody's fault. So that helps us out there. We x-ray everything, and so that can help us find bullets or fractures in tiny places that we can't, wouldn't normally see. And we do alternate light source imaging, which is something that Barry mentioned doing on, on some of their, their things. And we do it on whole bodies, and it can let us see little things that are maybe hidden in fur and feathers because animals are obviously covered in fur. And so if you're looking for things like fiber evidence, like on CSI they always do that, the alternate light source will let things like that glow, so artificial fibers will actually show up and we can pick them off. If somebody moved a body, we might be able to find evidence that they did that. 
it lets us see burn marks. So um, if a bird gets electrocuted on a power line, sometimes it's very, very subtle and the light will let those things glow. And then some kind, sometimes poisons have dyes in them that show up. So we use it for a lot of different things. That's probably the, the thing I use the most that I was never actually trained to do in vet school. It's kind of fun. Yeah, um, I know that another kind of part of your work is histology. I don't know mm -hmm. if um, you guys want to talk about that or... Yeah, that's the microscopic exam. And um, to me, that's the fun stuff. I mean, that's looking at the secret the things that you can't see with your own eyes. So we will take tissue from animals if it's if it's fresh enough and process it and dye it so that when you look at it under a microscope, the different cells and bacteria and things will show up. That's really interesting. And so that kind of helps us put the whole picture together of, of how this animal died and the circumstances around the death. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, next, we're actually going to go into a little bit more about genetics. So we started with what you can see and the shape uh, of the animal, and we're moving into things that maybe questions that are sometimes way more challenging to answer. So uh, please introduce yourself. My name is Diane Strawn, and I work here at the, in the genetics section of the laboratory. And um, you know, I love genetics, so I can talk a long time about it. But um, what we do is basically take... Um, Things like Barry pointed out earlier, uh, the difference between, uh, sometimes you need to know the difference between Asian and African elephant, and those characteristics aren't there. So they send it to genetics, and um, we extract the DNA um, by a method of um, basically taking a small piece of the um, ivory and um, turning it into powder. And um, then we just go through the process like we would with um, blood or tissue and you go through the extraction process where you basically remove all the cell wall and all the other stuff inside the cell and just isolate the DNA. And once you have the DNA, then you can carry through and do PCR, um, which is the polymerase chain reaction. Um, and then you can um, sequence the DNA and look at its DNA sequence or you can also um, look at nuclear DNA, which is what they call DNA fingerprinting in a lot of the human crime world where um, you get half from your mom and half from the dad. That's the nuclear DNA. Um, and so we use um, both mitochondrial sequencing and um, the DNA fingerprinting to do the work that we do in genetics, which is species ID. And um, we can we also do uh, geographic assignment for very uh, for some species and then um, of course um, individual identification so you know we can say that um, meat in the freezer came from the same animal as that gut pile in the field there so, wow. so tell me tell me a little bit more about some of the the questions you commonly get that you have to kind of piece out? Well, we can get all sorts of, we uh, basically like everybody else here in the lab, we can get um, anything from, you know, your North American species to your African or Asian species. So we, we can get for anything in the world coming in through here. And um, so a lot of the questions that we're asked to do is, what is this? What species is this? And um, because I think Pepper alluded to um, that the laws, are different depending on what species uh, uh, question you have. So, um, for instance, um, with uh, the wolves, I work a lot with wolves, so I tend to talk about them quite a bit. Um, but with the wolves, um, sometimes, let's see, before they started going on and off the list, um, you had an uh, area in um, the North and South Dakotas where um, Montana wolves were um, protected at a different level than wolves in um, Minnesota and from the wolves in Yellowstone. They're all three different levels. So if you found a wolf in uh, one of the Dakotas, where did it come from? Did it come from the Montana, the Yellowstone experimental population, or did it come from uh, Minnesota? Or is it even a wolf? Is it a hybrid of some sort? So those are the kinds of questions we got for, for the wolves. So, um, but we can get, um, you know, somebody smuggling in, you know, it seems odd, but people do try to smuggle in meat products, um, just like uh, people here eat elk and deer. Um, some people from other countries want the taste of their homeland and they try to bring it in. Um, and so they have meat products and what is this species? Can they have it? Can they not have it? Um, and what, what it is and how, 
if there's no morphological characteristics, which often there isn't with meat, um, that's up to us to try to determine what it is. We also get a lot of questions, um, like I said, with the matching. You know, is this feather from the same eagle? Um, is this um, deer carcass belong to the gut pile that was taken from um, a national park? Um, those type of questions. So we get we can get the questions all over the across the board. The one thing we can't do that we get a lot of questions is how old is the animal that this comes from. DNA won't tell you how old it is, um, but DNA will tell you what species it is, and um, we can use it to um, match um, blood stains and carcasses and so forth like that. So how long does it take to process some of this data? Is it pretty quick or does it take a few weeks? Or Well, that depends. It definitely doesn't take uh, within the 45 minute period as you see on TV. <laughs> that is definitely not, even on Mori Povich where they have the DNA results, that's not how that works. Um, if everything goes according to plan and the DNA is really good, so you have nice good tissue or good blood um, samples and, and not degraded samples, like ivory samples um, are harder to get through so that takes longer. You can do it presumably in about a week. Um, now that's if everything goes well. Now sometimes it will take much longer than that because if you go through the DNA extraction process and you go through the PCR and everything and you don't get a product, now you have to determine why. Is it because there was no DNA to start with? Is it because the, the process through PCR that you use to amplify the piece to get your sequence, is it because those, what they call primers, don't work on the species that you're looking at? You were told that maybe they thought the species was um, elephant, but it turns out that it's not. If there's no morphological characteristics, we have to go on what we think it might be. And DNA doesn't match all DNA, right? That's why everything is different, why we use DNA to determine species. And so we, uh, in the genetics section, if there are morphological characteristics, we, we work really closely with the other departments here because uh, we don't know, like I said, we don't know if the DNA is, um, if it's not working because there's no DNA there, if it's not working because it's, it's not an elephant, it's something completely different. Or um, if we also don't know if it's maybe there is DNA there, but um, it's inhibited by some um, chemical process that was, was in the substrate that it came from. So it can be really difficult. Um, so the time question can go anywhere from a week to to months sometimes, depending on what the what the problem is or the question is. But um, I think that, uh, you know, the good rule of thumb though is it's not, it's not 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's really interesting stuff. All right, so the, the other big thing um, about the wildlife trade and, and just in general is that, um, you know, we don't often think of our plants and, and how they're treated. Um, so we've got, it, if you want to introduce yourself, we've got some, some discussion around that. Hi, my name's Ed Espinoza, and I'm a chemist here at the lab. And most of what I've been doing in the last few years has been looking at timber-related trade issues. Um, as everything else, there is sustainable and legal logging, and we support that 100%. There's also quite a bit of illegal logging and uh, unsustainable. <clears throat> so the questions that we get tasked with is, what does it really mean when you have evidence that comes in as wood and where does it come from? And before I really talk about how the techniques work, I'd just like to remind everybody that our habitat is so precious to our existence. You know, I recently had a friend who, while they were at church on Sunday, they returned to their home and it had burned down. And a mom and dad and three kids lost everything they had. They did not have their games, they did not have any clothing, they had only what was left on them. And that is what habitat destruction is real impact in, in people's lives. And in illegal logging, that's what happens. You do not displace a single species. So far we've been talking about species per species, the way we use it, but many times in illegal logging cases, they just clear cut a whole forest displacing plethora of species that no longer have a place to live and perish as a consequence. So the animal extinctions or 
are a consequence of illegal logging, but most of us have a hard time of thinking of wood as being something that we should protect because you know, it's pretty, it's inert. I mean, how many trees have we really hugged? I mean, there's a couple of people who may do that, but you know, most of us, it's just the material, you know, we, so this is a, an example, an assemblage of certain types of species that are used in trade frequently. These round pieces of wood, they're, they're called cookies, tend to be of a case that involves uh, a type of Dalbergia that is only found in Madagascar and no other place in the world. Everybody has seen the movies about Madagascar and we know that in Madagascar we have this assemblage of species that are so unique that they don't exist any other place in the world. But here we're cutting trees specifically so that we can produce different very high items, very expensive. And um, I challenge your viewers out there, just you know, sign in to alibaba.com today, do a little search on rosewood, and you'll find out that you too can buy some of this, but the entry fee to buying is around $5 million. So it, it, is, it is not something that most of us use every day. Here we have another example of, I'll finish this there. <clears throat> This is a whole series of blackwoods. Now most of us consider blackwoods to be ebony, right? I mean, it is, it, is, it is classical. And because we live in the United States and we don't live in Africa, we tend to think that all ebony is 100% black. And so if you cut any ebony tree, then there you're going to have that. It turns out in reality, only one out of every 10 trees of this group, it's Diospirus, is completely black. So in order for us to receive a completely dark piece of wood like that, typically they cut down nine other trees. So in order to get a complete blackboard, there's 10 trees that are knocked down. One of them turns out to be beneficial. Again, going back to habitat destruction, that's exactly what's happening. And would you see large numbers of those come in? I mean... We, we have had cases that deal with eight to nine pallets full of little pieces of wood like this. This is, is used primarily for the guitar industry. They're, they're usually using fretboards because it's very high material, very hard. And uh, so that, that's what this uses. We also have a whole bunch of very unique rosewoods. Uh, these tend to come from Central America and South America. As it already was described, some of these are legal, some of these are illegal. These, these type of trees, this type of wood, it's a type of Delbergia that, that occurs in, in, um, in Brazil. We have them coming also from Bolivia, from Peru. Some of this is used to make violin bows. Uh, some of the best violin bows are made from endangered tree. And, but we don't think of violin bows as adding to uh, habitat destruction. And at this end, we have an assemblage of products made out of a tree, it's called agar wood, but it is really from a species called Aquilaria that is used only for its scent. And all of these products are only for scent purposes. This is a, 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 some samples of agar wood that are the whole pieces of wood that can be used. You know, you put them in a little uh, under coals and you can smell them. There's incense sticks, there's perfumes, there's more um, <clears throat> incense sticks used from Vietnam. These are particular samples that come from the Middle East. And so pretty much all cultures and all religions have gotten used to getting wood products for scent purposes. And the illegal logging going on in Malaysia, Indonesia, and part of the Southeast Asia Peninsula is incredible only to address some of the needs we have for smelling nice. So a lot of illegal logging, I'd like to wrap it up, is deals with habitat destruction, and that is that is the worst part about it. And so, so as a chemist, you look at these pieces, and you can actually um, kind of tell what um, what information or what what you're looking for to catch people. So, so yeah. So what we have been doing here at the lab is we've developed some special techniques that uh, have been looking at the chemical distribution of components that are found in the different species of wood that are protected. Turns out that these are really bad candidates for morphology. As you can yeah. see, trees are described by the flowers, by the leaves, by the, but we cannot see that here. Um, 
turns out that hardwood, which is the middle part of the tree, has very little and very degraded DNA. And so this has been a very challenge for the individuals trying to do DNA. So we have developed a technique looking at chemistry. And with these chemical tools, we can assign species of these wood types. Okay. And do you, do you also find that there are fake medicinals or, you know, scents out there that you come across? Well, we, we, we published some work on all of the agar wood uh, scents that we have analyzed. We've probably analyzed close to 200 different brands. And curiously, a large percentage of the products that are already ready for commercial use, not, not, the, not the raw wood, are in fact um, fakes. I mean, there's sometimes there are woods in which they add oils to give them a scent, but they're not the real agar wood. And so in those cases, the Fish and Wildlife does not prosecute them. It's, it's legal. You can have your stinky scent back, and it goes back in trade. Oh. Well, thank you so much. Um, that, I, I think that is a really interesting part of um, trade that people don't often consider. So I really appreciate your work. So, Back again. So, um, so we've been receiving a lot of questions, actually. Good. And, Fantastic. Uh, and we still have a couple of things, obviously, to talk about. But before we even go into that, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear um, kind of some of the ways that all these different pieces help actually, um, I guess, catch catch the bad guy, if you will. Um, you know, we, we've seen a lot of this and, and just kind of how this actually helps and maybe talk about how you go to court. And, sure. Um, um, for those of you, <coughs> excuse me, who've watched CSI type shows on TV, you, you get the sense that scientists are out there kicking doors and uh, dragging people into court and all of that. That's, that's so far from the reality. What you've seen here from the five scientists who talked to you is our work, which is getting at the items of evidence, figuring out their meaning, uh, their value, uh, and trying to link the suspect, the victim, and the crime scene together with that physical evidence. That, that is our job. Um, our job varies so much. Uh, you have been hearing six of the 15 scientists in this laboratory describe uh, what might be one day of a couple hundred in the year uh, that varies continuously. Uh, we never know what's coming. Uh, Dr. Espinoza was a little modest here. He's our chief scientist, as well as one of our chemists. Um, he is deeply involved in the wood analysis, but he has found himself waiting around in the decomposed guts of a 2,000 pound walrus, looking for cannon fragments. Um, wildlife forensics varies tremendously. It's a fascinating job. Our, and our, our primary job is to assist the investigators, help them um, First of all, find out if a crime has been committed, you know, what is the victim. Um, try to find evidence, uh, traces of a suspect or maybe many suspects using classic things like fingerprints and footprints and tire tracks, uh, matching bullets back to, to a firearm. Um, the, the cause of death uh, that you heard about uh, just a little while ago is probably one of the more complex things we do because most of the science sections are involved. Um, Becky may find stomach contents that she needs to identify. They may go to morphology. If there's enough uh, structure, hair, fur, it may go to genetics uh, to find out what that meal is all about. We're looking for pesticide poison possibilities from um, uh, blood, uh, urine, liver, kidney samples. We may find projectiles, uh, bullets, arrows in the body. Um, we may have an arrow sticking through the head of the animal. That doesn't mean that's the cause of death. So we're constantly trying to figure things out. It's a fascinating job. Uh, I'm very anxious to, to see some of the questions that have been posted here. Yeah, um, so I think one, uh, one question that, uh, we're getting two ones kind of on repeat, but one is how do you get into this work and you know, um, and how does wildlife forensics become your job? You know? uh -huh. um, uh, I, I think all of us got into this by happenstance. It was uh, we were the first big laboratory. There, before us, there was a handful, five, six scientists who did this kind of work. Uh, we're looking to bring on a second generation of young scientists. Uh, they may, uh, we, it may take five, six years to train somebody into morphology, uh, whereas we may get a young scientist right out of college that can go right into the DNA analysis. Pathology, far more complex, a lot more training. 
the analytical chemistry, the instrumentation is changing so rapidly. But there's something I, I learned, uh, I was told very early in my career as a young trainee deputy sheriff, is not to expect law enforcement to resolve issues. It almost never does. Uh, the best I was going to be able to do was to hold things at bay, to keep things from getting worse until smarter people came along. Uh, it's my sincere hope that the six of us today have been talking to some of those smarter people. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I, I can see how this is a growing field. And um, one of the other questions we're getting is, how how can we know, or what if we suspect something is illegal? You know, how do we? Where do they go? Next? Well, first of all, don't engage with the suspects, please. Okay. Uh, be, and and in wildlife work, uh, interestingly enough, the victims we're trying to protect can be very hazardous to us. A grizzly bear may not comprehend that we're trying to do something helpful. Uh, we have to be careful that we don't become a victim ourselves in engaging with some of the wildlife. Um, the, uh, the work is, well, it's worldwide. There's so many species out there. Uh, we're constantly reacting to what the game wardens, conservation officers, special agents, uh, wildlife rangers tell us in terms of where they're going with their investigations. Our job is to keep up with them with the science. It's fascinating work. Uh, we're going to be looking for that second generation. I hope that some of those may be people listening today. I'm even learning what a blog site is. This is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, well, that is something that we do want to stress is that, um, you know, we, we definitely can't answer every question, but um, we, this is not a one and done. We want to continue um, answering the questions and we'll be posting this video on our blog and um, we'll make sure that um, you know we keep you apprised of this incredible work. I mean, this this lab is doing stuff that you know I, I think in a lot of ways is solving crimes that you know we didn't even think we could ten years ago. So well, I can tell you, twenty five years ago when we got this laboratory going, I had no idea that we were doing what we're doing today. It just wasn't comprehensible. I can't imagine what the next 25 years is going to be like. I'll be retired hanging around the hillside uh, watching these folks and cheering them on. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll, we'll catch up with everyone online. Thank you.